Hey everybody, Jen here with Garden Jen's Journey. Uh, it's an interesting Sabbath day here on the homestead. Uh, we had a, a thunderstorm system come through overnight, thunderstorms and rain. Expecting more today, uh, but right now there's a lull in between the systems. So I figure I'd take this time and go for a walk in the garden. Um, things look pretty brightened up after a rainstorm, especially uh, lightning. Lightning adds nitrogen back into the air, into the soil, so it tends to perk things up. Um, also, I've been sick the past week uh, with a, a, quite the cold. I've been running um, a low fever for the past four days trying to beat this cold. I've been using the neti pot and that works wonders so uh, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about uh, Google neti pot and nasal irrigation and uh, trust me it does work it helps out a lot with the uh, congestion and the runny nose and things like that uh, it helps you get over colds a little bit quicker um, but overall it just makes things a little bit easier but uh, one of the best things to do when you're not feeling well is to get out and get some fresh fresh air as able. So I'm out getting some fresh air. Um, I'm going to do a short walk. I can't do much because it really takes a lot of energy out of me because my body is still trying to fight this cold. So uh, anyways, we're going to take a quick walk. or Not so quick, but anyways, a walk and see how things are doing. I will let you know ahead of time. You'll probably hear me breathing a lot heavier than, than I normally do. Uh, with my asthma and my cold and stuff. So just a heads up that, yeah, my breathing is probably going to be pretty loud on this video. Uh, so forewarning there. So let's go ahead and take a walk and see what's going on in our garden. So this is the container bed garden. And I have three container beds uh, set up. I'm supposed to have a fourth one, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, but these are the three that I've got going. You guys have been watching them grow. I have the strawberries, and then the this is the auroch with the Bloomsdale spinach. And then I also have another spinach in here. It's the Giant Noble, I believe is what this is. And it's looking a little thin right now because I actually just harvested a bunch of spinach. But it's beautiful. Look at these big, bumpy leaves. Just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. And then the same with the auroch. These leaves are almost like a, a velvet, a really neat um, plant. I really like it with the colors. This is the last bed that I just planted in here. So it's still uh, starting to uh, perk up a bit. I have some different colored chards growing right here. Uh, this is Merlot lettuce. It got a late start, so it's quite tiny still some carrots and then these are the ones I planted a week ago I have my Spanish onions and lots more carrots and look at the size difference these carrots are doing really big they're a lot bigger these are some of my older lettuces I have four seasons an oak leaf really starting to fill in and these are collards and then I have flame lettuce the color is a lot like the Merlot beautiful beautiful color and then a, a little bit more oak leaf but you can see the the contrast between the flame and the oak leaf just beautiful and then these are leeks and these are wild plantain that I planted in here so I had a little more access to clean plantain that wasn't trampled on or pooped or peed on by the various animals that run around our property our mints are really starting to perk up. I still have them covered just for safety right now. My sp uh, This is peppermint and it's really looking a lot better. About a week ago, I didn't think I was gonna have this plant because it, it only had basically this one shoot and this one shoot and that was it. But within this last week, it's grown a lot of side shoots so it's a lot more healthier. My chocolate mint is doing really well. And this one in here, this is my spearmint. I keep them covered because we have a very thick leaf mulch right here and I don't need the mulch bearing my, uh, my mints. So um, we have very thick leaf mulch here because our garden butts up right against a pasture and this grass 
comes right on into my garden. So by putting down this very thick uh, leaf mulch, I think it's about six to eight inches thick, I'm hoping to keep the pasture out there. Over here in this sad state of affairs, I have two of my loofah plants I planted just to see if they would survive so far. Um, they're looking a little sad, but overall they are surviving. Um, probably tomorrow I'll plant my other loofah plants, but I have a loofah there and I have a loofah there. And then this here, that's a weed, that's the dreaded nightshade plant that just gets everywhere. My potatoes and my pots are starting to grow. You can see the growth here and there. And then there, really starting to grow. As the plants get a little more full, I'll take the pallets off. The pallets are on here again to uh, deter our cats from using um, them as a litter box. <sighs> Those plants that I saved when my first uh, container beds collapsed, they are doing beautifully. These are mustards, and I also have a red Russian kale right here. So they are doing very well. The rain is really, I mean, they're just gorgeous. And then I have some Napa cabbage. I have, I think, three that I saved. Yep, I got, nope, two. Two Napa cabbages and then some more mustard. This is curly. And then uh, more mustard, and that is narrow spinach. It's a little bit smaller. This is probably the kind that they like to use for um, the baby spinach because it's a nice, small sized dainty spinach, but still gorgeous. So that's narrow spinach. My radish bed really starting to fill out. I'm really excited to see uh, the growth that just, just really uh, bloomed big time. And then this is where I have my sunflowers, the first sunflowers I planted. These are sunrise sunflowers. And I'm still waiting to see, I have a hops vine planted there I got this year. Waiting to see if it actually uh, grows. Um, sometimes when you buy bare root stock in the stores, um, they're dead. So waiting to see if maybe it'll come back. But uh, that'll be a new addition this year. Uh, I'll be excited if it starts growing because hops is a very good medicinal plant. So um, we'll see if it grows or not. Okay, so we're gonna make our way into the main garden. There's gonna be a lot of stuff laying around because uh, I'm trying to clean up some areas to make room for more plants. And the weather has been so wonky that it's hard to get enough good daylight time and help because I can't do it all myself. But uh, with the weather being so crazy, it's hard for me to get help on the good days that we have to get some of the stuff moved out of here and uh, uh, put in its various places, whether it's trash or whether it's um, recyclable material that needs to be put away. <laughs> so yeah, you'll see some debris laying around um, because we just haven't gotten it cleaned up yet. So, but I'll show you what um, is going on that's just really, really cool right now. And of course, Tiny is going to enjoy some grass. I have this area is looking really really shabby right now um, it's lost a lot of its mulch and so you see lots of weeds just crumb, coming up like crazy it's just horrible this this bed so I'm gonna have to relay um, some newspaper down and put mulch back over it and uh, go from there but um, Right now, I don't have time to kind of deal with this problem, and I'll show you why as we go. <clears throat> so this is my medicinal bed here. These are all medicinal herbs, um, So, and a lot of them are perennials, so they just stay here. I've got some um, volunteer plants that don't belong here. I've got this tree thing here and that tree thing there that we actually need to cut down and I'll probably put uh, a salt water solution around the roots to try to kill these guys because they're here every year and can't get rid of them. We think the roots actually run underneath the garage and that's why we can't get rid of them. So yeah, those, that there and that there will be cut down and hopefully I can kill it with some uh, natural solution. But 
anyways uh, we do have some beautiful valerian it has gotten really huge over the last week i mean it's just and this thing will get as tall as the uh roof line here so this will grow quite a bit and then my pastel pastel yarrow is really taking off this year and it's already starting to put some flowers on it i don't know if you can see the little buds starting to grow so I can hardly wait to see what colors this is. This is supposed to be a mixed pastel. Um, I don't remember the colors that are supposed to be on it. I don't have the package anymore. But I think it's supposed to be like yellows and blues and pinks. Um, I got it from Baker Creek. So I'm not exactly sure which one it is. So those are my two big plants right in this spot. And then I have lemon balm here. And then um, if you see the forest of green here. Oh, the this green here these are actually um, sprouts of stinging nettle um, I had a pot that was sitting right there I don't know if you can see the depression in the ground um, and if you've seen my videos from the past year or so I've always had a pot sitting there that I have grew grow stinging nettle in and I usually trim it before it goes to seed so it doesn't spread because it's very uh, evasive or invasive yeah get those words mixed up but um, it spreads like wildfire and uh, somehow I'm not sure what happened but um, it spread it's all over right here but what I'm going to do because it's quite easy to pull out um, is once once these sprouts get bigger um, and sometimes this, that's the best time to pull weeds wait until they get a little bit bigger because they're a lot easier to grab there's more more substance to them so um, I'm gonna wait till these are bigger and you can see I have a lot going on here once they get bigger I will pull them out and I will be able to dehydrate them and save them because I do use stinging nettle so um, they won't go to waste by any means but it's just like seriously I've been and you see it here it's everywhere right here so this is one thing that I try to avoid um, with invasive plants is I plant them in a pot and stuff to avoid the contamination that's here but this should be easily able to be controlled and remedied like I said once once the seedlings get bigger like about this size here I'll just go start pulling them and uh, I'll take care of them that way okay and just so you know these are all herb winter sown jugs they're lined up here uh, against my herb bed just so I can easily identify that these jugs here are all herbs we're waiting to grow and I've got like this is lemongrass and that's lemongrass but the plants that are growing in it are not lemongrass it's some type of weed that got in there but I'm leaving it alone because I'm waiting for the lemongrass itself to start growing all right so in this pot this is chamomile that reseeded itself I grew chamomile in here three years ago and it just kept reseeding so we just leave that pot alone because it's a very good plant I used to have a mint back there I planted last year lemon mint but it has not come back this year and that's okay um, I'm trying to get mints out of this bed and put them over in the what I call the mint garden that's where my containers were um, that way they can be happy and over there and they're not bothering anything <laughs> but I do have my chives my whorehound is doing really good this is the first yarrow that I planted and it's kind of sparse it used to take up this whole area right here and then I cut it back a little bit because it was really um, dense and so I thinned it out a little bit and unfortunately I think I thinned it out too much because as you can see I only have like this little thing here that little there and I have a few tufts here and there um, but it didn't do so well when I thinned it out my uh, this is echinacea that's come back and then I have blue hyssop and pink hyssop some dandelions and some sorrel I generally leave the dandelions alone for a while because um, the bees need them this time of year but I will eventually actually harvest them and and save them uh, let's see this is sage 
And I don't know why the p pink hyssop tag's there. I think it's supposed to be over there, but we'll see. Uh, this is bee balm. This is supposed to be the red bee balm. I have purple bee balm um, in the flower bed that I'll show you in a minute. But this is supposed to be the red kind. Last year it didn't get very big. It was just starting to grow. So this year I'm hoping, because as big as it is now, that we'll actually see those beautiful red um, blossoms uh, later. <clears throat> And then this is narrow leafed coneflower, or uh, echinacea. So it didn't put out anything last year, didn't get big enough. It was about that size the whole year. So I'm hoping this year I'll actually grow and look really, really good. And we'll see what it looks like as it blossoms. One of the biggest exciting things this year is this: these two plants here that are covered by the crates. Again, they're covered for the same reason the mints are in the mint garden. Um, the mulch is really, really thick here. It helps insulate the roots. And um, But during the warming time of the season, we try to unbury around the stems to uh, make sure that the, the soil can warm up enough. So what these things are, are fig trees. And these are two-year-old fig trees. Last year they didn't get any bigger than, than you see the sticks here. That's just how big they got. And uh, I'll show you this one too. And see that one didn't get very big either. But, and I've had a difficult time getting figs to come back. These are Chicago hardy figs. They are supposed to be hardy for our zone here in zone 5B. They're, they're bred especially for colder climates. So they're supposed to come back every year. Um, so I made sure that we covered them with a lot of leaves to protect the roots and everything. And praise the Lord, it worked because I have new life. And then down there, there's some brand new shoots. So they made it. I'm so excited that they made it. Even through that polar vortex, um, they survived. So just thankful of that. I just planted some uh, purple asparagus right here. Some uh, crowns that I got. And we'll see how that goes. Right now there's a lot of weeds all over it. Again, because it's bare soil um, and it's hard to cover. Um, when you're waiting for new seeds and stuff to come up, you kind of have bare soil until the seedlings emerge and then you can cover them back up. So right now I got a lot of seeds. And again, um, this is nightshade. It grows like everywhere here. And so I'm always pulling it up. And it's like a mint. Um, it sends runners out and the runners go for quite a few feet. Um, so, and it's kind of like some of those plants that have those rhizomes where if you leave even just a small piece, it'll uh, grow and send more shoots and keep on going and going and going. So the nightshade is a pain in the butt plant to try to control. And it is a poisonous plant. That's why a lot of people don't want to deal with peppers and eggplants and tomatoes and uh, potatoes. They're all in the nightshade classification. And nightshades are generally poisonous plants. But through years of testing and experimentation and, and knowledge, we now know that some nightshades can indeed be eaten, but not that one. All right, my peas are looking gorgeous. I have, uh, these are blue shelling peas here. And I'm so excited because I can never get peas to grow. Um, I've always been trying to grow peas in the warmer months and I didn't realize I was doing that whole business wrong. Peas are a cold weather crop, so they need to be planted when it's still cold out. And uh, you can see they're just doing really, really well um, growing this time of year. So I have those ones. And then on the other side, um, those are mammoth snow peas. So and they're doing really well. And then in here, this is where I have my kurabi and my beets. So I'm gonna um, put the cover back and I'll show you what these guys look like. Okay, so this is my kurabi. I have two kinds. I have 
Blower spec, if I said that right, and then Purple Vienna. So two Karabis, and then these are for run now beats, and uh, we'll see how they do. They're taking a, a long time to really start get going. Um, I always have a difficult time with beats, but I keep trying and trying and trying to figure out what I might be doing wrong or whatever, so I can apply it and uh, try to get beets to grow, because my husband loves beets. Right next to our beets, we have a row of garlic that we had planted last year in the fall, and it's coming up and it's looking really nice. So this is my, what I call, flower bed. This is my pollinator flower bed. Um, that's what I generally plant in here. Just a beautiful array of different flowers, um, whether they can be used for medicinal purposes or uh, saved for um, um, use in my bath products as a dried accent or just to look at. Um, this is generally where I grow my flowers and things to attract the pollinators. Um, I do have two perennial uh, flowering plants in here. Uh, this is bee balm, and this one's the purple bee balm. I showed you the new one that I have that's supposed to be a red one. We'll see how that does. Next to it, I planted a whole bunch of bachelor buttons. I have a whole bunch more to go. Bachelor buttons are known as corn flowers, and uh, they're used a lot in soap and beauty products because they're a beautiful color. Uh, they usually use the blue because it's just a beautiful color. But if you've ever priced how much the dried petals of corn flowers are, they're very, very expensive. And I'm like, you know what? I can grow those. So I have a nice selection of bachelor buttons. I actually have more that are uh, just growing. And I'll show those to you in a little bit. But so yeah, I have bachelor buttons. And then same thing right next door. I have calendula. And same thing, uh, I use it for medicinal purposes. I also use it in soap uh, making and um, herbal salves and things like that. It can be a little bit pricey, but not near as much as the cornflower. So I've got my calendula going on. And this is just uh, a few of them. I will be planting more as I get more seedlings going. And then intermixed with my flowers, I have some smaller plants that need a home. I have some lettuces here. I also have some borage. I got about four borage plants tucked right there. Um, I have some, uh, this is Malbina or Malbina spinach. It was a late starter and so I tucked that right here too. Um, I have more room for more flowers. I'm hoping to get my coxcomb growing. Uh, last year I had tornado red and the orange peach coxcomb which I got from Baker Creek and those guys got huge. Um, this is tansy. I planted that last year and you can see the size of that. Just for size reference, my orange peach coxcomb got even taller and bushier than this and it was, uh, I think I had two plants. It was just huge. So I'm hoping to fill this space with my coxcomb again because they're really, really beautiful. The bees love them. So again, this is tansy. Um, really a lush looking plant. I'm just really excited to see how it continues to grow here. I am planting cats as well. <laughs> You'll see sometimes throughout my garden. Um, I have four outdoor cats. Um, this is Sarah. <laughs> she came with the house when we moved in. She was part of the house already. Uh, so she hangs out here. And then we also have Tiny and his sister Flash which are both tiger looking kittens and you'll see them a lot. And then Smoke Bomb is our little little girl. She was a runt, but uh, we helped her pull through. So as we go through the garden from time to time, and I'm sure you've seen them before, you'll see that I have cats that grow here happily too. Um, one of the things that we do have to take into consideration when planning and planting our garden are the cats, especially since we use mulch and things like that. Cats bury their stuff, and so if there's a good medium for them to dig and bury their their excrements, we should say, I'm trying to keep this tasteful, um, 
they'll do it. So um, if you notice that they're trying to go potty in your garden beds, you have to put up some sort of repellent or something that teaches them that this, this isn't, isn't a place to dig and go potty. I don't mind them laying in the garden beds. They're not doing anything wrong, but uh, going potty is a big problem. And there's our tiny man. <laughs> so along the back wall here, these are all jugs that are right now on my books classified as duds. Um, none of these jugs have any type of growth in them, no sprouts or anything. But I don't throw them out. Um, I have learned over years of experience, if you want to call four years, years, but anyway, um, that they can surprise you. So these jugs have all been segregated away from the rest because they are duds. But I still keep an eye on them. I still make sure that they stay watered if they're starting to get dried out. And we'll see within the next month or so um, if anything germinates out of these jugs. They might surprise me. But right here in this spot, um, I'm starting to get my uh, tomato bed lined up. These are where I will have my Roma tomatoes. Um, I have cages for them um, because they are a determinate plant. They only get so big um, and then that's it. So I have 42 inch tomato cages. Uh, they're heavy duty tomato cages. I do not recommend going any smaller than 42 inch um, because the other ones are just crap to be honest. They're just crap. So 42 inch or bigger tomato cages if you're going to go that route for your determinate tomatoes. Otherwise a lot of people are building tomato cages out of uh, mesh wire and um, Oh, what a, a t-post or something like that and they're about six foot tall and that's cool I don't have those supplies on hand so I do use the tomato cages for my Roma tomatoes the other tomatoes which are indeterminates I am growing up on trellises or I will have um, some stakes put in the ground so we can grow those I have more jugs here these are late bloomers I have some herbs here, um, some celery, my snapdragons, um, I have some watermelon. Um, they're just a little uh, late to the party, but they're, they're starting to grow. And this bed is kind of hard to see right now um, because they're still tiny. And I'm starting to see insect damage too, which tells me I have something that's loving my plants already. Um, but I have, this is dino kale here. And so you can see some insect damage on that one and that one. Um, it's, a chew, it's a chewing damage and it might be a slug or a snail. Uh, there's no cabbage moss right now. It's been too cold yet. So it's not cabbage moss, but uh, it's probably a slug or a snail enjoying, enjoying my kale right now. So I'll have to take care of that. But in here, I have three rows. Like I said, you might not be able to see them on the camera. Um, these are my on my other bed of onions. I have red onions here. And then in this row cover, I have a lot of my brassicas, my, um, let's see, cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. There we go. Try to remember them all. Sometimes it's tricky, but yeah, that's what is in this thing here. I've got about four or six plants each of those just to see how they do. Um, we have a rough time trying to grow those here. Uh, our soil is not the best. It's got a lot of iron in it which really locks up nutrient, nutrients from the plant. But I've been using uh, Trifecta Plus from um, MI Gardener and also when I ran out of that I was able to get some Happy Frog fertilizer and that runs about the same percentage of nutrients on um, the same numbers as the Trifecta Plus and I can get that here locally so um, been really this year has been a heavy fertilizer year to see if that will help our crops because our soil out here is just really really poor quality and you can grow lots of grass you can grow lots of weeds because generally they don't require a lot of nutrients but trying to grow some good nutrient rich uh, vegetables that are healthy it requires a little more effort 
these are my other jugs that are just now starting to really get ready to, to um, be planted, which is great. I'm hoping to get some planting done tomorrow. Um, it's Memorial Day weekend and here in Zone 5B, Central Michigan, and a lot of the lower part of Michigan, uh, this is our weekend. This is when we start planting um, uh, the most, most of the garden. Um, if it's not in already, um, a lot of people start planting um, their gardens this weekend. Um, so I have uh, corn. You can see it's really starting to peak out there. I did have some other corn. I'll show you right here. Um, it was basically that big. And then we had a snap freeze, I think it was last week. And um, it killed my corn. So, but corn um, grows really quickly. Corn is like beans. And you can plant them in ground. You don't have to start them out in jugs. But for me, personally, um, with as thick as my mulch is in my garden, I mean, like I said, I have plants here. And you can barely tell because the mulch is so thick. So to try to put seeds in and know where they are and things um, doesn't work so well for me. Especially when I have to dig down about three, three inches to get to the soil below. I much prefer having well-established plants that I can see where they are and uh, I know we'll do okay. So I have my beans. Um, these will be planted with my corn in a three sister style gardening approach. So I have, these are Cherokee Trail of Tears beans. Beautiful beans. Um, and they have a rich history to them. I'm sure the name will, all, uh, you're already uh, aware of the Cherokee uh, Trail of Tears tract in history, even if you don't know much about it. So that's where those came from. They're going to be planted with another native plant, which is the blue in, um, I think it's Paswaga corn. Um, I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced. It is a native name. And, um, you know, they're, the way that they pronounce things is not <laughs> anything close to how I can pronounce them. But anyways, it's a beautiful blue corn. You can find it on Baker Creek. Um, but it grows like six to eight foot tall. It's a drying corn, um, so you use it for cornmeal. So this paired with this is perfect for the three sisters method to work properly. You need a tall, sturdy corn that's meant for drying. You don't want a sweet corn, but one that's meant for drying and it's gonna be very tall, very sturdy, and then a drying bean. Um, the way the three sisters method works best is you plant it and you forget it. Um, the corn grows, the bean grows, um, the squash that you plant grows around it. And all those, you just plant them, let them be. Um, and in the autumn, close to winter, um, they're ready to be harvested. The corn will be drying out, the beans will be drying out, and of course the squash will be curing. So that's how that method works. If you're having trouble with the three sisters method, especially if your beans are snapping and strangling your corn, which I had happened my first two years, it's because you have the wrong corn. So trust me on this one to, to uh, try to grow a very tall, sturdy, drying corn with um, a drying type bean and see how that works for you. I haven't figured out exactly which squash I'm planting this year. Um, I'm thinking about doing watermelon. Even though technically it's not a squash, it's still a vining plant that'll do the same thing, but we'll see. So I have some tears that are open. I have some more that I need to open. These are the new bachelor button seedlings that I've got going on. So I'm so excited. These only These are about a week and a half old. So really, really cool there. And these two sad jugs here, they're my flax. And I only got, I think, four flax plants growing there. So it's like, ah, oh, are you kidding me? But four, four flax is better than no flax. <clears throat> this is my other garlic bed that I planted last year. 
and I'm not really excited about uh, the germination rate. Um, this, these two rows here, I think I actually have three rows in here. I'm not sure, but anyway, um, should be full of garlic plants, and you can see they're a little bit sparse here. So I'm not quite uh, thrilled about the germination rates, but we'll see how they do, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to harvest enough where I can save some and um, then replant again in the fall a new crop. These jugs here are some jugs that I replanted because they were duds. Um, I only replanted, I think, eight jugs that I kind of figured were really duds. Um, so I just took uh, the extra seed that I had and replanted them. I had some tomatoes. Um, yeah, the, all those are tomatoes. Um, and I had quite a few tomatoes that have germinated. But these varieties right here, I have uh, Berry's Crazy Tomato, Big Rainbow, and then Yellow Pears. Those four varieties have not germinated at all. So I figured it was safe for me to just replant them. The original soil is in there. So the original soil, the original seeds that were in there are still in there. I just chopped dressed with some new soil and some new seed uh, because I really need to get some tomato plants going. Um, tomatoes get planted in about two weeks here. And then another beet, it did not germinate at all, which was weird because uh, you saw I had some beets planted. But this uh, cylindra beet did not germinate at all. So I just replanted that. And to tell you how easily I did that, I just took the pack and I just dumped it in the hole there, kind of sprinkled it around a little bit so the seeds are actually sitting on top. And then the honeydews I'm watching because we've had this wonky weather with uh, the freezing and stuff that I need to know where these guys are in case I have to throw them in the greenhouse real, uh, for overnight um, because they can't take cold so that's what that is so i'm going to take you into my potting shed and into my greenhouse and show you what's going on in here my husband built me this potty shed out of um recycled material and then this is my greenhouse i've showed you guys it a couple times um but uh this is the time of year that i can use it uh, about mid-april on so this is where we put our warm weather crops that need to stay warm um, we put them in here uh, we can't use it for starting seeds like uh, the big commercial greenhouses because this thing does not hold heat so when a lot of greenhouses are starting seedlings and stuff in february not happening here this greenhouse does not get used until about mid-april here and uh, what I do is my warm weather crops are, you know, the things that really like a lot of heat. Um, I do a double greenhouse uh, effect if I need a lot of warm weather crops. So I have these guys here are special tomatoes. Um, they are from Baker Creek. Um, we were uh, added this year as a, um, a seed grower. And so our trial run this year is to grow these tomatoes. And I only had about two plants out of 50. I have over 50 um, seed, seeds planted. Um, I only had two germinate so far. And we need to get these guys in the ground too because these are required to grow in order for us to uh, show that we can actually grow some seeds for Baker Creek. So I have them in here. And again, it's a double greenhouse effect because we're a little bit behind here with our tomatoes. Um, so they're in the jugs that you saw outside in the greenhouse to make sure they're nice and warm to help get that germination process going. I also have in here peppers. Peppers like heat. And so I have peppers in here. Um, I'm growing a lot of different ones for our business. So I really need to get them going. The ones for um, our personal use, I actually still have some outside. Just so I can compare the two in our zone, zone 5B. I'm sure in the warmer climates, uh, growing peppers in these jugs works wonderful. Because the temperatures get up a little bit warmer or a little bit quicker. But here um, in the uh, northern part of the states, um, it's been a very cold 
um, wet uh, spring this year and so the peppers have no chance to grow um, if left outside so we brought them in the warm uh, the greenhouse <clears throat> so I have um, banana peppers here and then I started splitting up again like I said I'm doing these for the business as well but um, I have banana peppers and some uh, let's see Roma tomatoes jalapeno peppers I started potting up um, some pumpkins I have lemon balm shoots that have been propagating these guys over here these are my other loofah plants if you've been following me at all on Facebook or on YouTube <clears throat> you saw that I was growing loofahs indoors I started seeds indoors because again zone 5b were quite cooler and these plants need a long time to be able to grow to be able to um, produce their their squash and then for that squash to to dry where you can harvest it at the end of the year uh, and make loofahs out of it so to have a well-established plant to go into the ground here in the north is highly highly recommended so I'll be planting a couple more of these um, tomorrow since the weather is starting to stabilize I feel safe planting some more of these in the ground I actually do have some loofah gourd seedlings um, that are in jugs out outside and they're just starting to germinate they look like these guys right here so I'm gonna do them in comparison it wasn't too hard to grow these indoors because I had five five containers five seeds and I grew them in a tote about this size so I just used a, a light that a clamp light over this to grow um, the seed starts for those okay so these are my tomatoes <clears throat> and I have some peppers if you remember from watching videos or following me on Facebook this year I had all these guys I had them in these totes and the totes were upside down they're like this on the ground and um, they were not doing well at all that setup was not working at all and so I brought them in here and um, just had them in here and they started growing started looking like how these peppers are small right now they started growing like that and then eventually I got to this size um, they're really 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 starting to take off so I'm excited so I've been starting to pop them up I've got some six packs that will be sold as six packs but then I also have the individual ones for those who just want to buy like one or two um, um, plants but I'm just so so excited because they are doing very very well and I was worried that I had that I had lost them um, because of my poor uh, winter sewing attempt with the totes <laughs> so anyways um, so yeah we're doing really good with the uh, uh, various tomatoes and peppers and things so I'm so excited about that and then I'm growing some different varieties of squashes just to have some of those available and they're doing really well um, again squash is something you can plant, plant directly in ground if you want to they grow qu pretty quickly uh, some people don't trust that they can do that they'd rather have uh, plants that are already established and that's fine I don't mind doing that uh, I grow seeds or seedlings and there we go so I'm going to show you what our tomatoes looking like in here if I can find it oh there it is so there is our two sprouts that we have right there those are uh, these are orange peach tomatoes yeah there's nothing going on there yet so orange peach tomatoes and I was told that these guys have a uh, not a low germination rate but they're kind of finicky to get going but uh, so I was aware of that when I started to tackle this project okay so we have some more jugs here by these peas we're waiting to grow but this is uh, really exciting here these are all our seedlings that we have gotten from those jugs like I said the peppers and the tomatoes are the only things we put in the greenhouse everything else we've grown from those jugs that you see on the ground and so we have lots of stuff here 
Um, the mints I propagated from the mints I showed you in the mint garden. So those are from my own plants. But we have lots of stuff here. <clears throat> lots of stuff. So, so excited about that. Yeah. So, winter sowing works. You can go, do it on a small scale. You can do it on a large scale. Um, it works. You just have to make sure that you do the process correctly. Try not to uh, mess with it too much and you're almost guaranteed success. Um, but there are those um, wrenches that get, that get thrown in the works. Uh, jugs don't seal right or uh, you have bad seed, seeds too old. Um, some seed, I found out this year, some of my problems were that um, some seed cannot be frozen. And I'm told all the time that the best way to store your seeds is to freeze them. Um, a lot of seed banks, they're kept at really, really cold temperatures because that slows down the aging process of seeds. And that's how they keep the viability a lot longer. But there's some seeds that cannot be frozen. It absolutely kills them. And uh, found out that nasturtium seems to be one of those seeds. I had six to eight jugs planted with nasturtium seeds. I think like five packets of nasturtium seeds, something like that. I can't remember. None of them, none of them at all germinated. So I had, um, I think one more packet of nasturtium seeds left and I took them inside. I soaked them as recommended and then I planted them and we'll see how they do. Um, but yeah, I found out that there's just some seeds that do not tolerate freezing. So winter sowing, it doesn't work well for those seeds because, uh, they just can't take being frozen. <laughs> so just one of those things that you learn. Um, but winter sowing overall works pretty well. So another thing that's been going on here is my elderberries are really starting to grow. This guy, um, a couple years ago, if uh, you saw my videos from a couple years ago, um, I had planted a plant, it's about that big there, and uh, they were doing work on this chicken coop here, and they kept dropping stuff from the chicken coop on top of the plant, and kept snapping it in half. Um, well, last year it bounced back, it grew really nice and full like it is now. And I actually got some elderberries off it, um, but I was surprised it actually survived. This year, it is really, really happy because it's uh, shot out some new shoots. I've got some here, and then I got some over yonder. So I'm really excited about that. It's really, really surviving, going strong. <clears throat> These are my two original elderberries that I planted, uh, I think, two years ago. Um, I think it's when I planted them. Um, I pruned them this year with that polar vortex. We got uh, frostbite on um, our elderberries. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. I learned this from M.I. Gardner who did a video on this this year. Um, I think his uh, video name is Lost 99% or something like that. But with the polar vortex on the tips of our plants got killed. See the, the dead wood right there? So um, on all my elderberries, I trimmed off all that dead back to, I'll probably trim this one back to, you see the big tuft right there? And then you got the smaller one. I'll probably trim it back to the, the big tuft where it's really, really showing a lot of life. But I trimmed all that back because it was all dead wood anyway. And um, I didn't want any disease to uh, you know come in um, with it rotting or whatnot. But even after the polar vortex um, doing quite a bit of damage, there's still quite a bit of life. I mean, you see how lush this is already. And there's quite a few brand new shoots. There's some shoots there, some shoots there. Um, so it's doing very, very well. Really excited about that. And last but not least on the homestead is our baby chicks. They're not so much babies anymore. <laughs> They're quite large, um, not quite full grown, almost full grown, um, but I've been trying to get them integrated with the rest of our flock over here. 
And they're just rather content being in here instead of out there. We've actually had to kick them out a couple times to try to get them to, to mingle. I don't want to say that I'm forcing them to mingle, but in a way I kind of am. I'm kicking them out of the nest, so to speak, so they can try to integrate with the bigger flock so they can be in the bigger pen. Because right now, they're getting a little cramped in here because they're getting really big. So um, I'll keep you updated on this, how this goes, if we can finally get these guys integrated or if my husband has to put up a new fence to extend this run. Um, because this was just supposed to be a brooding pen and a quarantine pen for sick or injured birds. Um, but if these girls don't learn to get along with the other girls, they might be permanent residents of this area. So that is the update here on the homestead. I hope you enjoyed the walk just to see how things are really progressing here. Um, I'm so thankful for all the growth that's happening. Um, I give the glory to God because without him, this is not possible. Um, you know, I can only do so much, but he's the one who is the giver of all life. And uh, so I just thank him for it. I, um, all the experience that I've been um, gaining along this journey, um, it's what helps us grow as gardeners and also as people. So I thank you so much for watching this journey with me. Um, if you want to continue to follow me on the journey, make sure to uh, subscribe to the channel so you keep updated. Uh, if you found this video enjoyable, please give it a thumbs up. Let other people know that, hey, this video is worth watching. I thank you so much for your support, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are. God bless.